Uh, this session is energy science session. But before we start, I want to congratulate Steve for the happy birthday. I will come for your 70th birthday, 80s, 90s, and 100th birthday. Yeah, I promise. But you have to promise by that time, per capita emission of carbon dioxide will be down to four tons, not 20 tons. You promise, okay. <laughs> Uh, that's a good thing. Well, <coughs> we do have two speakers today. The first speaker is Jay Kiesling. Uh, he's a chemical engineering professor in the Department of Chemical Engineering at UC Berkeley. And he's also a director of physical biosciences division in Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory. But he's known as a guru of synthetic biology in the newspaper. And you might know what is the synthetic biology. He certainly doesn't synthesize a biological system. He's asking biological system to synthesize for him. Now, let we welcome Jay to give the first talk. Thank you. Um, when I started uh, as a division director about a little over three years ago, the half Paul Alavisados and me to uh, work on produ production of energy and the research behind that. And I want to tell you about an effort that Steve spent a lot of time on and, and helped us start. Um, it's called the Joint Bioenergy Institute. And before I uh, describe what we're doing in the institute, I thought I'd describe a little bit about the process uh, that we use to get uh, bioenergy today, and particularly transportation fuel. Uh, this is the route from uh, sunlight to ethanol. And we go through corn in the US. Uh, corn, of course, is treated. You remove uh, the corn kernels and, and the shell around that. You get starch. And then enzymes, amylases, uh, produce sugar. And then microbes, of course, yeast, ferment that into transportation fuels. In this case, ethanol. Now, there is a proposal. And there are a few plants under construction right now to take uh, cellulosic biomass and turn it into ethanol. And the route is very similar to using corn. You go through a pretreatment process that treats the cell walls. Um, you get cellulose out of that. Then you have to break down those cell walls and produce a sugar. And then, of course, microbes like yeast produce ethanol from that. Now, the reason that the U.S. and many other countries want to start to use cellulosic biomass is because we have a lot of it. There was an assessment around 2005 by the Department of Energy and the USDA that basically came to the conclusion that we have over a billion tons of biomass annually that's available to turn into transportation fuels. And this biomass is in the form of crops, things like corn stover, uh, wheat straw, and then there's forest waste as well as various uh, urban waste, manure, etc. So in all, about 1.3 billion tons of biomass. Now, uh, if we compare that to U.S. oil production and consumption, uh, the U.S. consumed in 2007 about 7.6 billion barrels of oil. Uh, roughly two-thirds of that came from oil imports, and these numbers aren't going to exactly add up, and I can describe that later why. Um, and domestic production was roughly a third of that. Now, if you just took that 1.3 billion tons of biomass and burned it, the energy in that would be a little bit less than U.S. oil imports in 2007. If we use a technology that we don't currently have available, but that we think we'll have available fairly shortly, we could turn that 1.3 billion tons of biomass into transportation fuels just a little less than what we import in oil, uh, or we produce domestically in oil. So there is great potential here. In fact, we could eliminate the importation of oil if we could convert all of this biomass into transportation fuels. Now, a little bit more about that biomass. This is a plant cell wall. Uh, when the plant is growing, the plant cells would actually live in these crevices right here, and they produce this cell wall that's left over when the plants die. This cell wall is incredibly complicated. Um, and this is just a diagram. We really don't know how the cell wall looks, but this is an, an artist's rendition of what the cell wall might look like. And if we look in detail at that cell wall, 
It has cellulose running through it. It has lignin that coats the cellulose, and there's hemicellulose that cross-links the strands of cellulose and lignin surrounding them. And then that hemicellulose is decorated. And that's shown right here. So here's a, a more detailed diagram. Cellulose running down uh, the center. These cellulose fibrils are very tough. Uh, they're hydrogen bonded together. Um, the hemicellulose, again, is a cross-linking. And the lignin uh, is aromatic monomers that have been polymerized into this polymer network that coats <coughs> the cellulose and protects it. And then uh, this cellulose, of course, is made of sugar. Now, as I said, that cellulose is very tough. If you think about these pants, for instance, they're cotton, which is basically cellulose. When you put them in water, they don't dissolve like sugar. And that tells you something about the polymer that's formed, the cellulose polymer. It's very uh, tight hydrogen bonds that hold it together. And so breaking it down is difficult as well. Now, uh, I want to talk about each one of these steps and some of the challenges in them. So this first step in taking that cell wall and turning it into cellulose that then could be degraded into sugar, we use a pretreatment process. And this often involves either a lot of heat or acid or base. And the whole idea is to remove the lignin and partition it away from the sugar, which is in the form of cellulose and hemicellulose. And then we can use enzymes to break down the cellulose and hemicellulose into the sugars that then can be consumed by the microbes to produce the fuel. And that's shown here. We use uh, a number of types of enzymes. They're all in the family of cellulases that either make uh, cuts in the middle of the chain or exocellulases that break sugars off the end of the chain. All in all, though, we want to get sugars out of this process. Now, there are a number of challenges. The first challenge is that this lignin that wraps the cellulose and, and the hemicellulose uh, really occludes it so that you can't get access to the sugars in the cellulose and hemicellulose. And this lignin is very difficult to depolymerize. You know, plants can't walk away from their predators, so they've had to evolve mechanisms that allow them to evade those predators while they're, they stand still. And, some of that is, is bound up in this lignin that, that basically protects the plant cell wall and also keeps it rigid. In the enzyme area, we have a few enzymes that have been gotten from the environment. Basically, all of our cellulose cellulases come from uh, one fungus. Um, and these enzymes are being sold now, but they're very expensive. So we have few enzymes. There are very few that depolymerize lignin. Um, and the pretreatment methods that we use create byproducts that later poison the fermentation process. And, and the final set of challenges around the microbe that produce uh, the fuel. First, this fuel is, is fine as uh, an additive to gasoline, but it's not fine as a gasoline replacement. It can't be used to replace diesel fuel or uh, jet fuel. And what's more, some of these inhibitors that are released in this pretreatment process actually poison the microbes so that they don't end up producing the fuel. So seeing all of these challenges, um, there was a call about two years ago for uh, proposals uh, for institutes or centers. They're called bioenergy research centers from the US Department of Energy. And we brought together six partners to propose the Joint Bioenergy Institute. Their Lawrence Berkeley Lab is the lead with Sandia, Livermore National Labs, and then UC Berkeley, UC Davis, and the Carnegie Institute. We have four science and technology divisions, and we're in a single location located here in Emeryville at the top floor of this building. Rather than, so, so the traditional model for academic science is you have the, the money come into a central location, and then you send it out to all the partners. And those partners will have conference calls, maybe monthly or quarterly, and they'll have annual retreats, and people will talk about the research at those meetings. And so they might, results might wait for the conference call or even for the retreat. And we said, no, that's not the way we want to do business. If you want to participate in JBank, great. You bring your people in. Everybody's going to be located in one location. And all of these institutes uh, sent people in to the Joint Bioenergy Institute to work. We have about 120 people right now, and we'll ramp up to about 160. But we get to take advantage of all the tremendous resources in the Bay Area. And by the way, all of these resources are within about a 60-mile radius of Emeryville. And I'm going to talk about how we've used some of these uh, tremendous resources already. 
As I said, we have uh, three scientific divisions, the feedstock division, the deconstruction division, which works on pretreatment and enzymes, and the fuel synthesis division that works on the microbes that produce the fuel. The feedstocks division, which works on plants, has its goal to engineer plants, to understand how plants are made, and then to develop dedicated energy crops that can be used in the future to solve some of the energy problems. We, and by the way, we're working on uh, switchgrass, rice, and Arabidopsis. The deconstruction division has as its goal to understand how the deconstruction process works and to develop environmentally friendly deconstruction processes and inexpensive, economically viable deconstruction processes so that we can have fuels generated from cellulose that uh, compete with petroleum-based fuels. And then the fuel synthesis division their goal is to engineer microbes to produce next generation biofuels. And I'll talk about some of these biofuels, but it's to really engineer microbes to produce jet fuels, diesel fuels, and gasoline replacements. Finally, we have a technologies division, and their main goal is to supply technologies to all of these scientific divisions. Things like high throughput, high throughput technologies, functional genomics, and computation, and bioinformatics. Um, and, as I said, they're developing a number of high-throughput uh, resources. Now, let's just talk about solving some of these challenges. Even though we have these three scientific divisions and a technology division, that's not the way we're organizing and solving these challenges. Rather, the, we're approaching all of these challenges from many of the different divisions. And I'm going to tell you about, uh, in a few of these challenges, how each of the divisions is contributing to solving this problem. The first challenge is this occlusion of the cellulose by the lignin that wraps it up. And as I mentioned to you earlier, we don't have a way to get rid of this lignin. And if we could, then it would free all the sugar that's bound up in this cellulose. So uh, one of the things that we do in the pretreatment process is we subject these plant cell walls to a severe treatment that separates, hopefully, the lignin from the cellulose. But it isn't complete. So one of the things we'd really like to do is can we engineer the plant cell wall to make this lignin more degradable or even remove a lot of it altogether. But we have to avoid this phenomenon where the plants droop and don't grow. So how do you do that? Well, we can use evolution to solve part of this problem. So we can bombard seeds with fast neutrons and, and mutagenize the DNA. And then we grow up those seeds. But some of those plants are going to grow. Some of them aren't going to grow. And some of them are going to have altered cell wall composition. So we have to go through a number of processes to really screen these plants to see if they have altered cell walls. But then we want to know what genetic change has actually occurred during this mutagenesis process. And here's one of the earlier results where uh, we used a technology called DNA arrays that allows us to interrogate every gene in the plant simultaneously and find out which ones are being expressed and which ones aren't. And so this line basically tells us that all these genes are present, but you see this dip down here, this line down, and this tells us that there's been a deletion in the chromosome, uh, in one particular chromosome, and this deletion is responsible for a change in the cell wall. We can now clone out these genes, find out what they're responsible for, and transplant them into an energy crop. Now, this is a structure of that lignin that's found in the cell wall, and as I said, it's highly polymerized. And the bonds in this are very strong and aren't easily broken. Now, this is the process by which lignin is made. It's a free radical polymerization. Basically, any bond that's in the right location will be polymerized to form this uh, very networked structure that we call lignin. Now, we, lignin has in it some of the most stable bonds. What we'd really like to have are some of these bonds out here, amide and ester bonds, that would allow us to more easily cleave the lignin in the cell wall. So we'd like to incorporate some of these into that lignin. Now, one of the pathways that we're examining and trying to transplant into some of our transgenic plants is this uh, metabolic pathway. And it produces rosmarinic acid. Rosmarinic acid has an ester bond in it, which might be easily cleaved either by an enzyme or by a treatment, a chemical treatment. Now, this is what the lignin might look like once we get that rosmarinic acid into the cell wall. And as I said, it's going to have this cleavable linkage in the middle of that lignin, which means that we can either use an enzyme or acid to break that bond and then separate the lignin away. And then 
with these smaller pieces of lignin, the lignin should just melt away and release all the cellulose that, would, that has the sugars in it. Now, not only is our plant division working on some of these important problems, the deconstruction division at the same time is working on treatment processes that will be more environmentally friendly and will leave a cleaner source of cellulose and hemicellulose to be degraded. And the process they're using are called ionic liquids. These are really molten salts. So if you imagine table salt that could flow was a liquid at room temperature. That's essentially what they're using. They can add these uh, ionic liquids to a cell wall. And this is a diagram of a cell wall. This is actually switchgrass, which is one of the energy crops that uh, USDA and the Department of Energy are proposing for the Midwest. Before treatment, you can see this highly structured cell wall. After just a few minutes in ionic liquids, the cell walls start, start to swell. And after about three hours of treatment, you see no structure left in the cell wall. You add some water, the lignin separates from the cellulose, and you get almost pure cellulose and hemicellulose strands remaining that then can be uh, degraded. Now, another approach might be to try to find enzymes from the environment that would cleave some of these linkages that, that are hard to cleave. And, and the reason that we think there are enzymes out there, and actually we know that there are some enzymes out there, is that when you walk through the forest, you're not knee-deep in trees, right? Those trees, as they fall down, are degraded by microbes in the environment. So there must be enzymes that cleave these linkages. But how are you going to find those enzymes? Well, one approach we're taking is to go to the forest floor pull out the bacterial communities in those forest floors, and then interrogate them for the right enzymes. And the way you interrogate them is you put on a substrate, uh, uh, a, a very uh, stiff surface, uh, all the linkages that are found in lignin. And then you interrogate that substrate with enzymes that have been produced in high throughput uh, at JBay. And you find the enzymes that do the appropriate cleavage, and then you go and reproduce those in the laboratory. Now, another challenge that we're approaching is uh, the inhibitors that are found on the hemicellulose. So this hemicellulose isn't just straight sugar. It's actually been decorated by the plant to make it more resistant to microbes that might want to chew it up. But it has, in making it more resistant, the plants have also put these inhibitors on that get released into the fermentation and poison the microbes that produce ethanol. So one thing that we're doing is actually cloning out the enzymes that are responsible for producing these inhibitors and the hemicellulose and expressing them in transgenic plants to try to understand their function and then we'd be able to manipulate those in a dedicated energy crop. We are also looking, as I said, into ionic liquids that would give us a gentler pretreatment method that wouldn't release these inhibitors uh, from the cellulose and hemicellulose during this process. And finally, the fuel synthesis division and the technologies division is examining the effect of the inhibitors on the fermentation process and engineering pumps that would prevent these inhibitors from going into the microbes that are producing the fuel and, and therefore they'd be resistant to those um, fuel, uh, those synthesis inhibitors. And these pumps, by the way, are the same pumps that uh, cause antibiotic resistance. For instance, the multidrug resistant uh, microbes that arise in hospitals. It's due to these pumps. So we can retask these pumps now and get them to pump inhibitors out of the cell. Or later on, I'll even tell you about pumping fuels out of the cell. Now, uh, as I said, we have very few cellulases uh, to degrade this cellulose into sugars. And we need many more of these. And one thing we're doing is, uh, first, in the feedstocks division, trying to come up with a better cellulose that will be more readily degraded by the cellulases and he hemicellulases that we currently have. And again, this is more work on cloning out uh, the enzymes responsible in the plant for making cellulose, so trying to understand how those enzymes work. We're also going to things like uh, microbial communities. In this case, this is a compost pile, and this has been in operation for about 10 years. They take in uh, plant waste and degrade it into uh, cellulose, uh, and then it's turned into fertilizer. Well, we're going in and taking out the microbes from this and purifying enzymes out that are responsible for degrading that plant waste or paper waste. And this is actually a crystal structure, the first enzyme that we've pulled out. JBay has only been in operation for six months. We've only been in our location for six weeks. 
Um, and we've already got a crystal structure of an enzyme. And this uh, enzyme was actually pulled out of the microbes from that compost. And the structure was gotten up here at the advanced light source. And what's so interesting about this cellulase is it's got uh, a domain on it that looks very much like an antibody domain. And we're trying to understand exactly what that domain is. But we're going to have many more of these crystal structures coming out. And this is one of the advantages of being here at LDL is that we have access to these facilities. And just when you now take this enzyme and you put it with that purified cellulose, this is the cellulose fibrils. Uh, they've been arrayed on a substrate. And after treatment with the enzyme, you can see that there's relatively little cellulose left, and it's all been turned into sugar. Now, finally, I said that we want to produce uh, next generation transportation fuels. And this is the work that's going on in the fuel synthesis division. And one of the challenges we have is that right now we're producing what nature gave us, ethanol. And while it's a great start, it's an oxygenate, very few of our automobiles can take any more than 10% of it. It can't be used in uh, airplanes or in diesel engines. Um, and it can't be transported through our infrastructure, through pipelines, because it corrodes pipelines and even corrodes engines. Um, ethanol is really much better for drinking than for driving. <laughs> <laughs> so our challenge is, can we use synthetic biology to engineer a microbe to produce a next generation transportation fuel, a fuel that looks exactly like the petroleum-based fuels that we put in our automobiles right now? And that's what we're doing in the fuel synthesis division. These are, this is the central metabolic pathways that exist in all microbes, and here are some of the potential fuels that could be produced from those metabolic pathways. They include things like long-chain uh, alkanes like we have in diesel fuels and jet fuels. They also include some long chain alcohols. And what's so interesting about these potential fuels is that if they're produced in a fermentation, rather than using distillation to purify them away, they might just float to the top and we just skim them off like oil on water. Now, my lab has spent a lot of time engineering microbes to produce hydrocarbons. In this case, we produced a hydrocarbon that's uh, a great anti-malarial drug, and this is actually currently going, in, uh, going into scale-up at a pharmaceutical company. And over the years, we've actually, uh, so to do this, we used genes from many different organisms and crafted them together in a single organism. And over the years, we increased production about seven orders of magnitude. Now, can we retask this organism that produces this anti-malarial drug to produce fuels? And the answer is yes, we can. We can replace some of the genes that are specific for the anti-malarial drug with those specific for producing a fuel and, and get things like long chain alcohols, branch chain alkanes, etc. And here are some of the fuels that we're already producing and these are uh, uh, cetane number. Cetane number is the value it has as a diesel fuel. So this is the prediction and we actually sent some of these out and had them tested in small quantities and, and you can see that the uh, results, well, maybe you can't see, but the results are actually very close to what we predict, which means that we can predict pretty well what's going to be a good diesel. And we can produce uh, a large number of these already using our recombinant microbes, albeit in low quantities. And, of course, we're interacting with industry. There's uh, a lot of technology that's going to come out of here, and we plan to license this to any number of companies. And so we have strong interactions with industry. So just in closing, I think what you're going to see in the next few years, um, and some of this many years off, are dedicated energy crops that are going to be engineered specifically to produce transportation fuels. We're going to see uh, energy efficient, uh, cost efficient, environmentally friendly deconstruction processes for treating that biomass and turning it into sugars. And we're going to see microbes that don't just produce ethanol, but produce fuels that we can actually use in the transportation infrastructure that we currently have. Um, I'd like to thank Steve. He's been a real inspiration for all of us here at LBL. He's really responsible for getting uh, a lot of this energy research going and, and ultimately responsible for getting JBay and, and, uh, here and making it happen. And so thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure working with you and happy birthday. Any question? Please. What kind of estimates do you have in terms of the relative cost of this compared to gasoline? Well, uh, it's a good question. Um, 
if you look at uh, cellulosic ethanol right now, um, uh, the enzymes to degrade the cellulose and turn it into sugar alone probably add on the order of 50 cents to a dollar to a gallon to every gallon of ethanol, um, which is an exorbitant cost, right? And, and so because of uh, the way ethanol works in this country, i.e. we don't allow imports of ethanol and uh, we have price stabilization, um, we don't really know what the floating cost of ethanol is going to be. But certainly these fuels are going to have to compete. Um, there are some companies that are now currently uh, working on processes to produce next generation biofuels, um, mainly from starch and from uh, sucrose, from sugarcane. Uh, and they project that they can get these under $4 a gallon. And they hopefully will be producing around the 2012-2015 time frame. Please. Uh, great question. Uh, so the question is, are we going to make, by engineering these plants to be more degradable, are we going to make them a feast for everything that's out there in the environment? And the answer is, uh, some of these plants could end up being a feast for the microbes and, and pests out in the environment. You know, getting a plant uh, approved is, takes almost as long as it does to get a drug approved, sometimes longer. Um, and so plants go undergo rigorous testing uh, and environmental testing before they're put out there. And, I'm almost certain we'll generate something that's not going to be usable. But I think that through some clever engineering, we'll also engineer things that uh, won't be degradable by uh, organisms that are currently out there, but that we can readily degrade. So we'll have to do careful testing. Are these genetic seeds proven for uh, you know, cultivable land? <laughs> you know, um, I, I think that we have room for both. Um, especially, uh, there are a lot of crops that could be grown on marginal lands. Um, now, these aren't going to produce like the irrigated crops uh, that some people are proposing to use in like corn right now. But for instance, um, switchgrass. Uh, switchgrass and miscanthus giganticus, this cousin of switchgrass, uh, produce on the order of 25 tons per acre of biomass. And, and that uh, is about uh, two to five times more than what corn produces. So with the right crops um, and, use, and growing them in the right environments and on the right land, I think there's room for both food and fuel. Okay, the last question, please. Right, so uh, there are a lot of proposals out there. And in fact, I, there are even some proposals to convert coal-fired power plants. I don't know if it's been done, you probably know, to burning biomass. Um, yeah. So, so there is the possibility of using biomass to generate electricity directly. Um, one could think about then using electrolysis to generate hydrogen, but we don't have many cars that run on hydrogen. Um, so. Uh, there, there are a few other things you could do. You could also pyrolyze the, the biomass directly um, and then use fissiotropes maybe to synthesize alkanes from that. Um, the problem with that is you need an incredibly um, pure stream. The catalysts are still pretty expensive. So there are a number of technologies I think that we're going to see in the future. I don't think bio is the only technology. I think it's going to be one of many. There's some one person. Okay. Uh, 
uh, if you have your checkbook with you, we're happy to take donations. But, uh, you know, um, uh, so, so one, we invest very little as a country, as a world, in energy research, particularly compared to what we invest in healthcare research, and, and especially compared to the size of the industries, right? And we clearly need to invest more. What you have to realize is that these investments in these BRCs, these bioenergy research centers, are some of the largest investments the U.S. Department of Energy has made for basic research in uh, devoted to biofuels. So um, you're right that uh, we could do a lot more if we had a lot more people um, to a certain extent or if there were more of these bioenergy research centers. But compared to what we've had in the past, it's much better. Yes, yes. And, and I, sh I should mention uh, that there is a second institute at Berkeley, uh, the Energy Biosciences Institute, which came in roughly the same time as JBay. Um, and roughly had the same people involved, uh, at least from the start, <laughs> um, and is working on many of those same problems. So if you think about Berkeley um, as a location, we are the biofuels capital of the world, and in large part due to Steve. Well, probably we'll take another question. Please. I don't know of anyone who's done that. Um, you know, one of the challenges with uh, cellulose is, is not the hydrolysis of the sugar bonds. It's actually doing it at the same time that you're pulling it up and trying to break the hydrogen bonds. Those endocellulases have to be pretty strong enzymes. Um, so it's, it's a great thought. might be worth trying. Indeed. Indeed. <laughs> 